I mean, to talk about polynomial multiple recur recurrence and large intersections and rings of integers. Um, so today I'm mostly going to give background and some motivation and then show how uh, some sort of technical results of analytic theory can lead to the combinatorics and Uh, next time I'll do the actual uh, sort of technical ergodic theory, and if we want a third talk, I can talk about some more stuff. Um, but we'll see what uh, you all want to hear. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about, I guess, multiple recurrence. Then I'll talk about polynomials and large intersections, and towards the end I'll get to the actual setting uh, for this. But I want to provide background first. So the starting point, as with basically any talk I ever give is going to be the Verini's theorem, which you don't know what that says, but I'll write some more of it. So uh, if E is a subset of the integers with positive upper Banach density, Then for any k, there exists a let's say, integer a and a common difference d such that this arithmetic progression is contained. Okay, so I'm just going to write things combinatorially to start because I think it's uh, maybe a little bit easier to see what's going on than going immediately to the ergodic theory. But I will eventually go to proving things about measure preserving systems. Okay, so I want to think about Semiradi's theorem and what we could do to try to improve this result. So this is really great. We get arbitrarily long arithmetic progression in any large subset of the integers, but there are other things that we could try to do. And I want to list maybe some different kinds of improvements on this result. Actually, does anyone have ideas how we could improve this? I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, you know something, so we can do it. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot now. So there is two improvements, and I'm wondering about if there are uh, intersection, if anything's known. So one is the Galois direction, where we take uh, sub zero density by using logarithms and stuff. Yeah, and like the that. other is the set of common differences is IP star. Sure. Is there any sort of theorem that combines the two in one way or another? Mm -hmm. I know IP I star don't, is. I don't. I don't. I don't know much about uh, things with. Lower density. I mean, I suspect that maybe you can do something um, using, I don't know. So, right, so Green Tile, for instance, show that primes contain arbitrary long arithmetic regressions. And really, what they show is that if you take, if you start with some random enough looking subset and then you have positive density in a random looking subset, you have a summary AD type result. Um, and so, I suspect that there should be maybe something with IP star, but I don't know. Um, but Okay, so I'm not going to talk about sub zero density, but I'd be starting to think. So we can say things about this possible set of differences. So one kind of improvement would be that the set of common differences is large. Okay, and so what are the different things here? Well, one, this is maybe not really an improvement. It's just maybe looking a little bit closer at some radius theorem or taking Furstenberg's proof of this, uh, the set of possible Bs is syndetic. So I think probably the right attribution here would be to Furstenberg in his 1977 proof. Uh, but if so, he'll say we can improve this more and say that it's IP star. And I guess that's uh, first the Burbank Hanson also. And 85. Okay, 
And there may be some other variations on this, but this would be one type of thing to look at is how big is the set of possible common differences. Another thing we could do is look at some combinatorial configurations that are not arithmetic regressions. So other more general combinatorial configurations. And there are a lot of examples here, but the ones that I maybe don't care about for this talk, uh, what do I want to start with? I guess we could look at, say, something like having two elements whose distance is a square. And this would be Ersenberg and Sharkozy. that uh, around the same time and more generally than this we could actually replace instead of looking at d to the up to kb we could take k polynomials as long as they have the property that they're what's called jointly intersected execute a a plus p1 of d a plus p k of D if this family is jointly intersected. Okay, so I'll maybe define that in a second. Uh, this result is Bergelson, Lagman, and Lassine. I guess polynomial configurations for zero constant terms, Ferguson and Lincoln, about a decade earlier. But for this form, Ferguson and Lincoln, let's see. So we can look at also, do you know, is this the, this result the, with the three authors has a completely different proof than the original result by Ferguson and Lincoln? Is that right? Yeah. So there's a big, thing that happened between 1996 and 2008, which is uh, really developing the theory of characteristic factors and uh, turning everything into proving equidistribution in no manifolds. Um, and so that makes the, the proofs, once you have that big apparatus, it makes the proofs much easier. Uh, and so that, that's the technology that I'll be using for the results, which I haven't stated yet. Oh. Uh, okay, so we can improve and say there are lots of different D's. We can get polynomial configurations. Of course, they're much more general things than this. I want to talk about polynomials though. And okay, a third type of improvement that we maybe think about a little less, uh, but that I'm interested in is can we find a common difference D for which there are a lot of progressions? So this, I'd say maybe some differences. are popular. So the terminology of popular differences is usually not used by ergodic theory people, but uh, people who are doing basically the same kinds of problems in a finitary setting use the terminology of popular differences. And I think it's a meaningful term. So what do I mean by this? I mean that if I fix my common difference D, I should get as many progressions with common difference D as I would expect from a random set, or equivalently as you would expect if your system was weakly mixing. So we get density of B to the K plus one as the density of the progression. And this only works in some cases. So the, the simplest case of this, well, okay, let me just write out what I want here. So there exists some difference such that the density of the set of A's forming a progression of length K plus one with common difference D 
is at least density of E to the K plus one, and I need to do minus epsilon. And this works if K is one, two, or three. It does not work for length four or longer. And this is, so K equals one is due, this is just Pinching's recurrence theorem stated combinatorially. So that is a very old result. Let's see, yeah, 1935. Uh, but the k equals two and three case is Bergelson, Host, and Kra in 2005. And there are also binary versions of this due to green and green and tau. Wait, what exactly are the, what are the settings in which these terms are applying? Yeah, so this again, E is just a set with positive upper bonnet density. And uh, if K is one, two, or three, so length two, three, or four arithmetic regressions, you can find some common difference such that the number of progressions with that common difference is like as good as a random set. Okay, so this is what I am going to mean. This is what the large intersections part of my title is about, because if we start going into measure preserving worlds, we're looking at the measure of some intersection being large. Okay, so what I'm going to focus on is, I guess, a combination of these two things. So finding like a popular difference for some polynomial configurations. And if there's interest, I can give a third talk where I get some improvement on how many popular differences there are. Um, but that can be kind of separate. It's not, uh, they're just sort of a separate theorem that upgrades any, any results of this kind from synthetic to much stronger. Okay. Um, here. So still sticking to just the integers for now, I'm going to state some results combining popular differences with polynomial configurations. So the first one is Francis Panakis and Kra, uh, 2006. And this is going to look maybe similar to some stuff that Andre talked about in your kind of theory seminar a week ago. So we're going to take polynomials that are uh, linearly independent. They should be still integer valued. Uh, so you evaluate an integer, you should get an integer output. And we have a zero constant term. Okay, and I'll say this again combinatorially. So what do they say? For any set with positive density. And here I'm just going to use ordinary upper density. I'll mention in a bit why I can do this. Um, so for any set with positive density and for any epsilon greater than zero. This set, let me switch to n just so I don't have d and density floating around in the same expression. I can get this set to have density of e to k plus one minus epsilon, and this set is to that. Okay, 
So if we have independent polynomials, then we can get this kind of popular difference result. Um, okay, and then Francis and I guess a couple of years later show that you can also do this for polynomials that are all just integer multiples of the fixed set. So you can ask just which polynomial configurations allow for some popular difference theorem. And I think the starting point is to take the sort of extreme cases you take polynomials that are linearly independent, or you could take polynomials that are all coming from a one dimensional space. Things in between get more complicated, but those are the two kinds of results I'm going to talk about. So now we're just going to take uh, integer valued polynomial with zero constant term. And we get a similar result. So for any set with positive upper bound intensity for any epsilon and for any a, b that are distinct and non-zero, we can get a popular difference theorem. D star this set and a set for length four will be synthetic. So similar to the situation over here, where we get popular difference results only for k equal to one, two, or three, we have a similar restriction here. So if you start going to longer expressions, things aren't gonna work out. And also if you start trying to do a, b, and c, that where c is something that's not a plus b and no permutation gives you that, then you have some four point configurations of a different shape, uh, you also run into issues. Or at least potentially. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's still open, right? Uh, it's a little unclear. So in the the binary version is solved. Um, so there's a paper from uh, Sa Sani and Zhao where they study popular differences for uh, patterns in finite groups, and they show that if you don't have this kind of parallelogram condition, then you will not have popular. Um, Wait, or got it. yeah, so they do. So they do. I mean, the thing to think about maybe is just take finite cyclic groups, um, and that's some sort of finite version of. So then, yeah, what you fix the density and let the size of the symmetric group increase, yeah, so that eventually things do or don't happen in the limit, right? Um, and I, I know so there's. Yeah, it is not totally clear to me how to take the finite pair results and directly get something radically. Um, but they have something, I, I would be surprised if there's a difference between those two situations. Yeah. But then, but then, okay, so. Yeah, I think there's, there's a, uh, we want to be also on the paper about this problem where you have, you have some, uh, yeah, we initial, some equity distribution condition or something. That's a equivalent to this being good. Uh, no, actually, we also, yeah, I read them with Joel and Wenbo and then mm -hmm. We also study this problem. And uh, yeah, I think this left open in interesting the case that if we get this, like, if we don't have the parallel logram to like a precaution like this, is this, do we still have like, uh, 
uh, popular influence. And we try to, to do something like um, when A equal to 1, B equal to 2, and C equal to like 4 or something, four, something like that. And then we, we cannot do that. Uh, so, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering if it's solved or not. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this exact problem is solved. Um, but I, I, my feeling is that I would be surprised if this is not a necessary condition. Um, just because there is some, there's finite break stuff that does resolve this in that setting. Um, and I mean, it's, it's totally crucial to the, like, you can get down to basic Sequoia analysis and having some symmetry between yeah. these things for quadratic polynomials is what's really important. Yeah. So we'll see that in group, but yes, it's not fully clear to me, but I think it's necessary. Yeah, so this, this will be like very nice if like, um, someone can like would use the uh, results on the matrix from the uh, finite field of finite schools yeah. like that to translate to the great theories to at least answer these specific questions. Right, this is always an issue of like there's, you have results in organic theory and finite combinatorial results. And once you know one, you kind of, have a clear conjecture for the other one, but it's not always a. Uh, the ergodic theory doesn't always easily imply a nice finite combinatorial statement. Finite combinatorial statements don't always easily translate to ergodic theory, so it's a little bit. Yeah. Uh, okay, so are there any other questions about the these two results? So what I want to talk about now is is generalizing these to uh, another setting where we'll consider uh, bringing them a little bit more general than the integers. Okay, so what is the setting for the main results? Uh, maybe you review a little bit, some small amount of numbers here. So, so K is going to be a number field, which is a finite algebraic extension of the rational numbers. Okay, so you're you can think about things like uh, rational numbers with i or uh, square root of two, other things like this, just throwing in some algebraic numbers. And the I'm going to look at is the ring of integers. K, which is all of those elements of K that are algebraic integers, meaning that they're roots of monic polynomials with integer coefficients. So uh, roots of monic polynomials over T. And so in these examples, we get the Gaussian integers and I maybe need to be careful here. Uh, do I just get square root of two here? Is it like one plus root two over two or something? I only remember that you need to be careful. Yeah, so <laughs> let me let me not write the next one because I might mess it up. But yeah, I'll see you definitely right. I mean, you can definitely do roots of unity as well. I know that's a yeah, so that one's a trivial theorem, but right. Okay, so I mean, for getting some examples of configurations, I think the Gaussian integers is a convenient thing to think about geometrically. Anyway. Um, okay, so I need some definitions for polynomials. So I'm going to say that a polynomial. With coefficients in this number field is integer valued. K valued. 
uh, if it takes integer values at integers. And then the two notions I'll need for polynomials, I think I erased intersected before. Um, I'll come back to that. So we're going to need a notion actually a little bit stronger than linear independence. It reduces to linear independence if you assume you're a constant term. But I'm going to say that a family is independent if for every non trivial linear combination, okay, putting out space, uh, the okay, so every non trivial linear combination should be non constant. It's a little bit stronger than linear independence, um, but it will be needed for some of the ergodic results we want to prove. Uh, what, oh, okay, so why is it stronger than linear? So n and n plus one are linearly independent, but they're not independent. Um, but if we assume that we had zero constant term, then this is just the same as linear independence. Um, and also, actually, if you assume that your polynomials are jointly intersective, this will again be the same as linear independence. So once we get to the sort of combinatorial applications, this isn't different from linear independence, but uh, it's needed for some equidistribution distribution results because you can get, you start taking combinations and you can end up with constants, which are not going to be good for, you know, constant sequences that can be equidistributed. Okay, so we say that they're jointly intersective. If uh, I'll try it this way. So for any M, we can find an N such that uh, what do I say? Yeah, P times N is divisible by N. So modulo any M, we can find a simultaneous root of all the polynomials. So this is satisfied. If your polynomial has zero constant term, they'll be jointly intersective because you can always just take zero and zero will be in any of these groups. Uh, but there are more general things than zero constant term or shifts of length. Okay, so yeah, right then if I just have a single polynomial. I'll say the polynomial is intersective if it satisfies this condition. Okay. Um, so the maybe it'll be clear once I get to something, but the, the reason for defining jointly intersective is that if you looked at if I took as my set E just M multiples of M, then well E minus E is still just going to be multiples of M. And so to get any kind of recurrence results, you're going to need your polynomial to be intersective or your family polynomials to be jointly intersective. But the, the surprising thing is that this turned out to be sufficient. There aren't any other So let me now, okay, so I'm going to say, try to save a little bit of space and some time. And on top of these results, so here is the result. So together with Bergelson. So now we're going to take uh, polynomials in a number field that are integer valued. And uh, instead of this, I'll have joint the intersective. And then this, all of this gets replaced with integers, and there's a result. You said it doesn't matter whether independent or linearly independent. Yeah. So because if you have 
So why does it not matter? If I have independent, sorry, if I have linearly independent jointly intersective polynomials, they will be independent. Why? Well, if they're jointly intersective, then they have to have this common root. If I take any linear combination of jointly intersective polynomials, it will be intersective, right? Because if I take a linear combination of things divisible by m, they'll still be divisible by m. And so, uh, okay, every combination is intersective. If a linear combination is constant, the only way it can be constant and intersective is if it's zero. So you couldn't end up with a non-zero constant from intersective. So whether or not you have linearly independent or independent isn't going to make a difference here. Okay, and then we can do something similar here. So again, so sorry. I'm wondering um, the theory of characteristic factors yeah. and equidistribution like null manifolds that um, because it applies to general you know systems over some measure space. Uh, you can use all of that for this ring of integer setting as well. Uh, Am I right? Yes, but you can't. That's not true for most rings. So you, the reason that I'm dealing with the setting of rings of integers is it's kind of the most natural, more general setting where all of that works. So uh, this has to do with the fact that when I multiply by some element, I get a finite index subgroup. Um, so this is so for so help, this is it's important that this ring is homomorphically finite. Um, the reason for that is if you want to do structure theory. Okay, so you can take your polynomials, you can do one Japan orbit, reduce it down to linear things. And once you've done that, you want the weakly mixing part of your system to still behave nicely. And if you take a weekly mixing system and then take the sub action along a finite index subgroup, it will still be weekly mixing. But if you mm -hmm. didn't have finite index, that's not true. I see. So that's one piece of it. And the other piece is um, we need some kind of integer structure in order to get no manifolds. So if we had a homomorphically finite ring, but with, you know, you could you could get like finite characteristic kinds of situations where no manifolds are not the right objects, and so you'd be proving equidistribution on something else. Right. Like I guess if you took direct sum of Z2, that's probably yeah, so you can, finite. Depending on what multiplication you put on it. Like, oh, yeah. So you, you can look at like uh, you can look at polynomials. Over a field of characters say two, that will be a homomorphically finite ring. Um, but it'd be it's infinitely. There's all sorts of issues with the group structure that will make the manifolds not the right thing. So we kind of need we need something about the multiplication giving us finite index, and we need something about the additive structure being just integers, and that basically gets us to, to the same. So, so yeah, can you tell me like what is the state of art like? Oh, uh, of the kind of highlight of the uh, possible structure theories, right? So, 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 so suppose I have proof for, for Z action, right? Yeah. And yeah, so how general it has been, right? So, yeah, so let's see. So, the what's needed, all that's needed here is um, a result from uh, Grismer. He shows that for ZD actions, as long as your uh, so there's something about finite index. You have some matrices acting in a finite index way, then the most cross structure theory still works, and that's supposed to be finite index. Um, so I have a paper with Bergelson and uh, Andrew Best where we do the beginnings of structure theory for any abelian group. Right. Um, so we can get basically the point is we're trying to do popular difference theorems. So we only do structure theory up to this level. Um, there's another paper, so independent of us, um, or Shalom proved the same, or at least some of the same popular difference theorems. 
Um, and he has a bit more of a sophisticated structure theory that I think gets to any uh, level of complexity for alien groups. But it's less, it's not as nice as dumb animals, but there's some kind of structure theory for, for any alien group. So I have a question. Yeah, so in your paper with uh, Andrew and, and, and Vitaly, uh, so you you say that you develop structure theory for, for K3, right? Yeah. Uh, can it be generalized to larger K? Um, yeah, so so Orshalom does this for arithmetic progressions. Um, so by K equals three, we, we actually are considering basically any Linear patterns, we take homomorphisms in groups, right. um, which makes it even more complicated. Right. Um, I think, okay, so, so the basic fact that your tower of factors is formed by compact extensions at each level, that we have. Um, what we don't have um, that Barcelona has some. Beginning though is uh, like this nil, nil one structure. Um, so our structure theory looks more like um, what like Hans and the do, and uh, what Host and Crod did a little bit before developing their whole nil manifold business. So I, I don't know. Um, I think our approach is probably the wrong one if you want structure theory for more levels. I see. But uh, okay, so in your paper, did you lay, uh, did you show that the the um, the one that cuts of the the three four term arithmetic version is still neo manifold or no? So we don't have we don't have like a topological a nice topological structure. We show that it is um, a so you have a Kronecker factor, and then it's a skew product with a compact group over the Kronecker factor, and the co-cycle satisfies a Hans-Lacine equation. So it has some sort of quadratic behavior. Uh, so I might actually, I'll write down at some point a complicated looking formula for um, multiple atomic averages of that length that, that holds for a given group. Okay, so one more question. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah, I also I own Twitter paper. Uh, and I realized that uh, so you you guys like uh like check is uh in the middle, like you you have the first version is very short, but then you make it very long later. Yeah. And is that that's, that's the long part is for the structure theory of water. Yeah, so we in our initial version we had a mistake um that we claimed that some Co-cycle was quadratic, which is false. Um, it should be. It's not quadratic, but it it like it has some quadratic like behavior. That if you start doing some kind of derivative, you get something uh, more or less linear. Um, but yeah, so we had to we had to fix that portion, um, and it. So the whole approach doesn't actually change that much, but there was just there was an error that we had to fix. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so right, so so for independent polynomials, yeah, this results, um, and then we can also do something for this situation. So again, with Bergelson, we showed. Okay, take polynomial in a number field that's integer valued and intersective. And then we have this result almost. So this one is fully here. This one we need one additional assumption on A and B, which is that their ratio is rational. Uh, so I'll maybe 
hmm, talk a little bit about why we need this additional assumption. Uh, so th this is actually, this is, I don't think, necessary. It's a sufficient condition. Without it, I think the result is false. But there is, this is a little bit stronger than what's needed, I think. Um, but we don't actually have anything. We didn't prove anything stronger, but we do have a conjecture about what the right condition is. Um, and this is related, our conjecture comes from some things that have been done in a finite area setting again uh, about popular differences that suggest that for general A and B, this result should be false, uh, which is, I was surprised by it, but. There are some results of the finite set. Okay, so 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 in case of uh, uh, pricing like this uh, theorems, that's condition automatically like satisfied, right? Yeah, I mean if you have integers in the range is right. So the, the the reason for this is that for length or progression, so with uh like with Andrew. We show that a result like this holds for any linear configurations, meaning take whatever home orders you want with some finite index condition, you should get a popular difference result. For length or we need to assume that our homomorphisms are just multiplication by an integer. So we're really just looking at basically our current progression. Um, and wait, wait, wait. there's some reasons for that in, in that are very technical. Um, but you just said you have the first part of that result for homomorphisms. Or for for polynomials. Well, so this this result that's stated here is correct, um, but we also for any abelian group oh. you can take homomorphisms, um, and that's what we basically our, our strategy is going to be to reduce that, we reduce this to homomorphisms by going from polynomial to linear. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so anything that we prove, we have to first have the linear result before we can have the polynomial result, and. Uh, the best we can do for, for like four is assuming we're dealing with integer multiples and not the more general homework. Okay, so let me now go to ergodic theory and explain some of how we prove these results. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, let me switch back to black. Is translate this into ergodic language. So this result, we can say this family is jointly intersected family of independent integer value polynomials. And for any measure preserving system, okay, so from this point forward, anytime I write down a measure preserving system, this T is not just a single transformation, it's an action of this ring of integers. Um, okay, so for any measure preserving system, for any set and any positive epsilon. Uh, this set is synthetic. So that's just directly translating this into ergodic theory. And you'll notice here that this is any measure preserving system whatsoever. It doesn't have to be ergodic. And that's why I can get this result with D bar. So this 
setting, I'm going to have to assume ergodicity, and that's why I need D star. So there's some subtle difference between D bar and D star, depending on what assumptions we actually have on our systems. Okay. Uh, and this result is actually going to be false for non systems. So there are some counterexamples already in the paper of Burgos and Hobson Crock. Okay, so we're going to have a similar setup. So P is intersective and integer valued. And then we're going to take, okay, just to be consistent with our paper, I'm going to switch from talking about A and B to R and S for no real reason. So R and S are going to be distinct non-zero. And then for any now ergodic measure preserving system, any measurable set, any positive epsilon, we have results of this. So Again, if the ratio is rational, we can get length four. So now we have results of ergodic theory, so we can start using techniques from ergodic theory. Um, okay, so I think if I did everything correctly, this should just be a straightforward translation using some version of first order correspondence principle. For this one, we need an ergodic version. But, yeah, I think the, the correspondence principle is known for amenable groups, right? So you can yeah, yeah. So you just use cite the correspondence principle. Okay. But there is so the, the what I want to emphasize here is the maybe version of the correspondence principle we're used to is like this one. You just take a measure preserving system and then uh, you can get from that some results for density. Um, but you can show that if your system, if your result is just true for ergodic systems. You can still get a density result for upper bonic density. So the thing you lose is that by assuming ergodicity, to get the density of this set to be bigger than density two minus epsilon, you have to adjust your formula sequence as you change n. That's basically what this is saying. Whereas here, if you don't assume ergodicity, you're dealing with the same formula sequence the whole time. And so this is a stronger statement than this one. But on the finite level, these sort of become looking like the same thing. And so uh, I suspect if, if you wanted to prove some finitary version of these results, they should both be true. And we're going to see isn't really, shouldn't really be an issue there. I don't know how to prove them though. So that's good. Also, I don't know if this comment is meaningful to you, but what you just said about uh, assuming a uh, ergodicity means that you have to change your uh, polymer sequence as you change it. and that makes me think about the difference between quasi central sets and central sets is that central sets have some uniformity kind of like the first theorem where the n is the same every time and quasi central sets still satisfy the central sets theorem but 
they lack some level of uniformity. So, I don't know if that's relevant. I don't know. I I, I don't know enough about sample sets to know. Maybe there's something. Um, okay, so. So what's the strategy for grouping these tools? Okay, there are actually maybe a couple of different approaches. So for this result, I believe Andrew and Andre now have an independent group of this using the techniques that Andre talked about last week. Um, but for this one, at least I think we have the only group. So our strategy is going to be, oh, I lost my set A. to take expressions like this and look at Cesaro averages of these expressions and try to control characteristic factors, show that those not are just, not only are they nil factors, but we can control the complexity of the nil factor. And once we have the complexity controlled, we can get the positive difference. So I erase it, but you remember the, uh, for Bergelson plus and Kron's results about popular differences, you needed your progressions to be short. And so the way I kind of think about this is that you want, if your if your the complexity of the factor controlling your expression is low, you can expect a popular difference result. If it has high complexity, you're going to start losing popular differences. And so we need to actually control the complexity of these polynomial families. And that's Going to come through some macro distribution results, which I'll talk about next time. Um, so, okay, let me at least write down some theorems. I guess I'm not going to be able to derive A and B from these theorems, so I can start with that next time. Okay, so the big theorem to sort of get this process started is due to Bergelson. And Robertson. And it just says that if you have polynomial multiple ergodic averages in rings of integers, then there's some nil factor that's controlling your average. Let me write that down. P1 through PK are going to be. Um, constant and essentially distinct. I guess that just means that if you take two different polynomials and take their difference, you don't want to get a constant. Uh, and I want them to be integer valued. Then there exists some R such that for any ergodic system, and any bounded functions. Let me just write this down and then I'll explain so notation. This limit is going to be controlled by the R step nil factor. So this is the R step nil factor. And this notation here means, so UC stands for uniform Cesaro. Um, 
So if I take a Pizarro average along any Fulner sequence, the limit exists and it's independent of the choice of Fulner sequence. Okay, so this is the starting point. If we want to look at polynomial configurations, we at least know that nil factors are uh, what's at play. And so what we do is starting from just knowing that it's some nil factor, we can reduce the complexity in these particular cases where the polynomials are independent or multiples of some fixed polynomial. So if they're independent, uh, okay, let me just, I'm running out of long time, so let me just write this maybe very briefly. So for independent polynomials, uh, we can reduce from some nil factor to the rational Kronecker factor. So in other words, if your system is totally ergodic, then this limit will converge to the product of intervals. Okay, and and that other setting uh, for polynomials that are all multiples of a fixed polynomial, then we can reduce from a nil factor with unknown complexity to the nil factor. Let me make sure I get this right. Uh, K minus one step nil factor, which is the factor that controls uh, if I had linear averages. So if my polynomial is just n, and in this case, if T is totally ergodic, then the limit uh, is independent of this polynomial. So not only is the characteristic factor the same, but if we have a totally ergodic system, the limit we get will be the same as if we replaced P with just N. And so what these allow us to do is, so in this case, basically we're going to reduce everything from polynomial averages to linear averages. And then we know for linear configurations, these results hold. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's basically the idea. Um, and then here, so for independent polynomials, we can reduce to the rational product of factor. And so the whole approach here is basically to um, take some power of our system that kills the rational Kronecker factor, and then we'll get convergence to the correct limit. So we'll get a popular difference. So I think next time I'll start just showing quickly how you get theorem A from theorem C and theorem B from theorem D, um, and then spend the bulk of the time actually try and prove these results. So this is where most of the technical work is involved. So, so theorem A is the um, generalization. So, uh, Pressing the case and cry. Uh, yeah. Right. So this is a generalization of pressing matrix and cra, and this is a generalization of pressing matrix. Yeah. And the technique is quite also similar, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the technique is similar. Um the so it, the equity distribution so basically theorem C and D are both gonna boil down to uh, equity distribution results on the manifolds, and uh, those become uh, a little bit more involved than in the case where you're just looking at the integers. Um, so they're going to look similar, uh, but they're it's harder because you have more variables floating around. So, so if you don't have them, if you just reduce to Kronecker instead of the rational Kronecker, it is still possible to get the probability. Um, so I mean, 
in some sense, yes, but you maybe implicitly be reducing to rational factor factor in the process. So you could uh okay, so the, the fact that rational chronic factor controls that limit. Um okay, so what I'm gonna say is not literally true because once we start having long expressions, considerations in L2 aren't uh, are like Hilbert space considerations aren't really the right thing. But uh, at least at like the level of charge these characters is what I want to this, it would be true. So I, I kind of think about this as what's the splitting controlling the behavior? It's the rational and total paradox. So you could prove sharp busy using compact weak mixing splitting, but um, probably what you want to do in that case is use wildlife distribution theorem. So for any of your irrational points in the spectrum, you're going to get equidistribution, distribution. And so that app is not going to contribute to the average. Weak mixing doesn't contribute to the average. The only thing that contributes is rational. So even if you start with compact weak mixing, you sort of use something to get to rational uh, as the first step to then from there, then you want to basically kill the rational spectrum by taking some power. So um, yeah, so really what I'm going to do here is actually first reduce to Chronicler and then apply wild distribution to see that it's actually rational. Term. 